Terrific. Well, let me welcome you all. Thank you, Dr. Kim. It's my privilege Thank to introduce you, Ambassador, right. Ambassador Robert O'Brien. Ambassador O'Brien served as the 27th U.S. National Security Advisor between 2019 and 2021. He brought to that role deep experience at the intersection of international law, diplomacy, and ge geopolitics. He began his legal career as an officer in the Judge Advocate General's Corps, the legal arm of the U.S. military. He served as a U.S. representative for the 60th session of the U.N. General Assembly. And he served also as the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. In between these and other public service roles, he's led a successful career in private practice, specializing in international proceedings. He's currently chairman of the American Global Strategies, LLC. He's also chairman of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Throughout his government service in resolving Iraqi claims in the First Persian Gulf War, in orchestrating the release of U.S. hostages, in strengthening U.S. alliances in the Indo-Pacific region, among other achievements, it seems that Ambassador O'Brien has consistently played central roles in shaping America's evolving role in the world. We look forward to hearing the assessment of the Korean Peninsula, U.S. national security issues, and the broader Indo-Pacific region. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador O'Brien for his remarks. Thank you. Welcome, Ambassador. And you have well, the floor. And go ahead, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for that very kind and generous introduction. And Dr. Kim, thank you for having me. Uh, what a, what a honor it is to be here. I, I've seen the list of past speakers that have addressed the Korean American Studies Group, and uh, a number of them are friends, and and all of them are very distinguished. So I'm I'm honored to be uh, counted among them now. I'll make a few opening remarks and then maybe open it up. I think it might be more interesting for everyone if we do Q and A and maybe have some questions and answers after my opening remarks and drill down on some of the issues that we talk about. So the 21st century is beginning to take shape as a defining moment for the global order. And it's different than the prior century or at least the second half of the prior century and maybe more like the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, some say that autocracies are on the march against the free world, and we can certainly see strongmen from around the world appear emboldened and try to challenge the international order that sustained the peace for the last seven, seven decades. Perhaps more concerning, we see that a new axis forming to challenge the U.S. and its allies and destabilize the world. Those countries, Russia, Iran, North Korea, China, are incre increasingly aligning, and although their interests and ideologies are different, they have one common goal, and that's to displace the United States as the leader of the free world and to change the international order. And while the free world has rushed to support Ukraine in its defense against the Russian invasion, the enemies of freedom have also stepped up to support Moscow. Iran is supplying drones. China is keeping the Russian economy afloat through oil and energy purchases. And as many are now reporting, Pyongyang is planning to supply Moscow with lethal aid, including. 155 shells from the massive stockpiles of artillery that North Korea maintains. So while the Russia-Ukraine war obviously deserves attention, the U.S. and its allies must not be distracted from the growing threats to our national security in the Indo-Pacific. Until the recent summit between Kim Jong-un and Putin, news of North Korea's threatening and destabilizing behavior has faded from the headlines, with the exception of the, the odd rocket uh, or missile launch or test over Japan, but certainly in America that's been the case. Kim Jong-un, like his father and his grandfather before him, has rejected the principles of individual liberty, freedom, and the rule of law, and is continuing to advance North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile capability. And this is just aside from my prepared remarks, what's amazing about the DPRK is that notwithstanding the, the massive sanctions regime, notwithstanding the famine, the lack of a, a, an economy, the, the ingenuity and the hard work of the North Korean people and the dedication of the government has allowed them to continue with these nuclear and, and ballistic missile pro programs uh, in a way that I think is astounding to, to observers from the West. Pyongyang is earnestly working to get a new satellite to get new satellites into orbit and even challenge US dominance in space. Kim will continue these pursuits unfettered unless we work together with our allies those who have a stake in managing the risks as we do to stop him but thankfully we have like-minded partners in seoul tokyo canberra and beyond these allies understand the threats 
and they, and they're, they understand them in some ways more deeply than America, and they were willing to work with us to counter them. This summer, we witnessed with great promise the emergence of the unprecedented cooperation between the US, South Korea, the ROK, and Japan at the historic trilateral summit in Camp David. By agreeing to new intelligence sharing, strategic consultation with one another, and coordination of military capabilities, the US, South Korea, and Japan have demonstrated that the Korean Peninsula is not a blind spot for our national security, and we're preparing to meet any geopolitical crisis or pro provocation there with strength. Now, again, I, let me depart from my prepared remarks for a moment just to say this, this summit at Camp David, which I welcomed, and, and uh, from time to time I'll be critical of the Biden administration, but I think this was an accomplishment that they deserve credit for. But that that summit built on a foundation that we established in the prior administration. When I became National Security Advisor in 2019, the Jusomia was in, in a real, real risk. And I called a meeting, a trilateral meeting with Director Chung and Kita Morrison, my counterparts in South Korea, the ROK in Japan. They came to the White House. We had a hard day of negotiating, but we got to an answer. We got to a, 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 a accord to keep the Jusomia alive. And then we went into the Oval Office and met with President Trump and, and Director Chung and Keita Morrison had the opportunity to explain to President Trump you know, why they were doing this and how important the US alliance was with South Korea and Japan. So I was, I was really happy to see that move from the national security advisor level up to the presidential to the head of government level. And I compliment the, uh, the uh, Biden administration on that accomplishment. Similarly, other groupings of like-minded partners, such as the Quad, the Oxus, the Oxus partnership between Australia, the UK, and US, which I believe is going to expand. I mean, Oxus will not remain those three countries. I expect Canada, Japan, possibly South Korea, and others to join Oxus. Uh, those, those, those alliances, together with the, the tripartite alliance between the a partnership, I won't call it an alliance yet, but the partnership between South Korea, Japan, and the United States will contribute to our security in America, but also to security in the greater Indo-Pacific region and in Asia. It's how our collective military, economic, and diplomatic power as prosperous free nations is multiplied and reinforced through these partnerships and these alliances. In addition, it's important to remember that economic security is national security. Our adversaries not only pose a military threat, their actions have an impact on our economic security as well. The supply chains for the world's most critical technologies like semiconductors, and let me add to that, EVs, AVs, battery technology, green, green energy technology, run right through Asia. And adversaries like China are trying to use the vulnerability of these supply chains to exert pressure on the US and its allies and to achieve their own geopolitical aims. And just to give you an idea of what, what they're willing to do and what they can do is what we saw a few years ago when China was upset with Japan and threatened to cut off their supply of rare earth minerals, rare earth elements, REEs. So economic coercion is a primary method by which the CCP seeks to achieve its goals and promote its interests. The CCP sees economic interdependence as folly and its own national security interests and, and national economic interests as a zero sum game. And many of you have negotiated with the Chinese over your careers. So I certainly have, both in the private sector as a lawyer and in government. And the Chinese always talk about a win-win solution. That's their favorite phrase in negotiations, as many of you know. But what they really mean is a win-lose scenario where Beijing wins and the other side loses. Military exercises, communist propaganda, and coercive, coercive business practices seek to undermine the stability of our partners, first and foremost in the Republic of China, Taiwan, but also in Japan and the Republic of Korea, South Korea. Who plays a role? All of these countries play a key role in global, the global supply chain for semiconductors as well as other advanced technologies. So, if China can drive a wedge between our Asian partners and America, they harm our economy, promote their interests, and harm the economies of our allies. In the United States, our businesses have begun to wake up to the reality that China poses a formidable risk to their economic well being, and they're looking to relocate and restructure production and manufacturing. Some of it is onshoring, bringing it home, because we had much of our industrial base hollowed out by the Chinese during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
when people naively believe that if we turned a blind eye to Chinese economic coercion, IP theft, uh, dumping, unfair trade practices, that if we turned a blind eye to those things and let China get rich, China would become more like us. They'd become more democratic, more liberal, and we've seen just the opposite happen. So we need to onshore, but we also need to friendshore because being able to buy key components from our, our allies and trusted partners is almost as important to America as, as onshoring. So once these nearshored, friendshored, and, and, and onshored supply trains are, are developed, we need to ensure that there's an uninterrupted supply of uh, uninterrupted commerce between those supply chains. And so, so the Chinese can't disrupt them. And again, what we're seeing in Taiwan with the, the incursions on the, on the, the, the median line and the air, air identification defense zone, and what we're seeing in the South China Sea more recently, this has been going on for some time, but becoming more aggressive recently with respect to the Philippines and other nations, shows that we face an unprecedented risk and we'd be reckless not to address it. Now, in spite of these challenges, I remain confident in America's future, and I remain confident in the future of our allies, because we have a way of life that we want to protect, a way of life that revolves around individual freedom and liberty, free expression, and, and we're not going to give it up. And, and South Koreans have shown the will to fight for, for their freedom, and, and have sacrificed many, many thousands of lives to do so, as have Americans, as have our friends in, in these other countries in the in, in, in Indo-Pacific, including we're going to see increased threats on India from, from China. So whether we're facing off against Kim Jong-un or Xi Jinping in the Indo-Pacific, Putin in Europe, the Mullahs and Ayatollahs in Iran, or any other dictator that may emerge, one principle remains key. And I used to tell this to my staff at the NSC when we had our monthly or weekly meetings with the senior staff and monthly meetings with the, the entire staff, Weakness in international affairs is provocative. Strength is the most powerful deterrent to aggression by our adversaries. And so even the perception of weakness, and we, unfortunately we had some of those, that, that perception exists or is existing today after the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, the way that it was executed, the invasion of Ukraine. But I can tell you that America is fundamentally strong and our allies are fundamentally strong, even if we appear uh, not to be practicing peace or strength at this point. But we need to get back to the, that doctrine of peace through strength because it works. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, just just wrap up and, and let you know I'm optimistic. And there's a, a concern I'm, I know among friends and allies that America is becoming more isolationist, more inward facing. And there is some of that. We have massive challenges here at home. We've got a, an open border. We have cartels that are trafficking and in, in human trafficking and drug trafficking and opioids and fentanyl and, and cocaine and, and other drugs are coming over and, and harming our citizens. Seven to 100,000 of our citizens are dying a year from, these, from I, don't, I don't want to call them overdoses because many people buy drugs thinking they're legitimate and it turns out they're laced with fentanyl it ultimately comes from China, but it's transshipped through, through Mexico by the cartels. Uh, we have homelessness, we have political discord. So we're facing a lot of challenges in America, but we're going to overcome those challenges. And, and although we may be focused on those challenges, we know that our great strength, and I used to tell this to people all the time when I was in office, the great strength that America has is we have true friends. We have true allies. You know, China has no allies, maybe North Korea, maybe Pakistan on the day they spend enough money to rent them for that day, maybe a few rented governments in Africa. The Russians have no real allies, but we have great allies. We have great allies in South Korea. We have great allies in in Japan, we have a great partnership in Taiwan. Our, our partnership with India is expanding. Uh, so we, and then of course we have the greatest alliance system in the history of the world with NATO. Well, maybe I shouldn't say the history of the world. The Romans did pretty well with their Latian allies, but uh, but maybe since Roman times, and uh, and we've got great alliances on a, on a bilateral basis throughout the Indo-Pacific with Thailand, with the Philippines, with Australia. So America has great friends, and it's, it's those friends and partners that give us the tremendous strength and reach around the world. And, and the friendships aren't based on economics alone. They're not based on diplomacy alone. They're not based on power politics alone. They're based on shared values. And those values between the, the value of individual liberty, the value of the rule of law, the value of the, the idea of free expression, those aren't going to change. And we're going to stick together. 
And at the end of the day, you know, we're going to do what uh, when Ronald Reagan was asked how the Cold War ends, uh, he famously said, we win, they lose. And when, when people ask us, how is this battle between autocracy, between the Xi Jinping's and Putin's and Kim's and, and Ayatollah's ends and, and the, the free world, I don't want to call it just the West because the free world is Korea and Japan as well and uh, other partners in Asia and ASEAN. But how does the free world and the, the defeat the autocracies? I'll say the same thing Ronald Reagan did. We win, they lose. So with that, Dr. Kim and, uh, and Daniel, I'll, I'll wrap things up and open up for any questions. And may God bless South Korea and the people of South Korea. May God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, before we get into the Q&A, let me make a short comment. ICAS is not an agent of any government or foreign principal. There is no foreign funds involved in ICS activities. Thank you. Joe Bosco, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador, ahead. for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your comprehensive overview. You mentioned Taiwan a couple of times, and I wanted to ask you, President Biden, of course, as you know, has made four, on four occasions, has made def definite statements of commitment to defend Taiwan. But each time, the White House staff and the State Department have qualified his, his comments, indicating there's no change in U.S. policy. U.S. policy, of course, for decades has been one of strategic ambiguity. And as a result, China has never been sure that U.S. would come to Taiwan's defense. But it has also never been sure that we would not do so in, the, in a certain crisis depending on the circumstances is how we, we, we uh, phrased it. So my question to you is, is it time now, given what's going on in Ukraine and, and the Afghanistan debacle, for the U.S. to sh demonstrate and state a clear commitment to the defense of Taiwan officially and through a vetted process, not with ad hoc impromptu remarks by the president at a, at a press conference? And secondly, can we demonstrate that commitment by sending a carrier battle group through the Taiwan Strait, which has not happened since 2007. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Joe, you know these issues better than anyone, and uh, so thank you for the question. You know, I, I kind of, I, I think what President Biden was trying to do after Afghanistan, and you know, some, some of his comments were before the invasion of Ukraine and some were after, but I think he was trying in his own way to restore the idea of strategic ambigu ambiguity I think the Chinese were starting to believe that we would not come to Taiwan's aid. And I think Biden was trying to show that it was at least trying to, to raise that, that doubt uh, in the leadership of the CCP in Beijing. Now, it was interesting, as you noted, that on all four occasions, his staff you know, went right out, Jake Sullivan and others went right out to, to walk back the statements the president made. And I, I kind of chuckled because I thought if President Trump had made a statement four times and I'd gone out and walked it back, I would have had a, a banker's box of, of my personal items and been walking out to West Exec Avenue and saying goodbye to my friends at the White House because I wouldn't have survived walking back the president's statement four times. So it's a, obviously it's a different White House. Uh, I, I think the ideas are trying to maintain strategic ambiguity, and I think Biden's trying to put a little bite into it. Uh, there, there was an old saying back in the Reagan years, I, I started out in politics and, uh, as, a, as a young intern in the Reagan years, uh, let Reagan be Reagan. And uh, that was a conservatives felt that Baker and some of the others had too much influence. And Jim's a good friend of mine and secretary. And I, I thought it was fabulous. But people thought that, you know, the Mies and some of the others were kind of being pushed out by the more Bush people. And so they, they talked about letting Reagan be Reagan. Uh, what I'd say now is let Biden be Biden, at least when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, and uh, I never thought I'd say that as a, a Republican, but. Uh, I think I think President Biden does have an instinct there that that's that's correct, and he's trying to send a message to Beijing that that uh, hopefully they're hearing. But the the walkbacks don't help. Now, as far as is changing the policy, one of the things that we did and and that, that I declassified. And there's lots to talk about declassification these days, but I did declassified the uh, the additional guarantees or the additional uh, accords that we had with Taiwan that the President. Uh, both the Nixon, Ford, and, and Carter uh, had given to Taiwan, and th those assurances have now been declassified. 
Uh, again, the idea was to send a message to, to Beijing that uh, that we do have a commitment to our, ally, our, our partners. I don't want to call them allies because they're not allies, but but serious, very strong partners. Now, I don't know, uh, Joseph, if changing strategic, you know, the, the our, our commitment to ambiguity on a strategic sense to a, a more clear statement is what will really deter China, the CCP. I think what does deter China isn't rhetoric, but it's action. And you alluded to that in the final part of your comment about sending a carrier battle group to the Taiwan Straits. I don't see there any reason why not. I think we ought to send a message that you know we can operate inside the A2AD envelope they've tried to create with their Dongfang missiles and other platforms. And that we, we have our own, and I, I'm not gonna get into it on this call, but you know we, we certainly know how to operate within an A2AD environment and fight within that environment and fight and win. You know, certainly a great cost, but but I, I think we'd prevail. Uh, and I think sending a, a carrier battle group would, would certainly send a strong message to Beijing. But I think what's more important at this point is that we send the weapons that ba that Taiwan, that Taipei has, has ordered and paid for, and that we're not getting to Taiwan. And I, I understand of the 24 billion, about 16 billion of it, the F-16s, and you can't build an F-16 overnight. But we got to make sure those those production lines are hot, that they're fast, that we're working two and three shifts. And and we need to. I think what will the, a bigger message to the Chinese communist is this is to send the a well, it's not even aid to send the weapon systems that the the taiwanese have bought and paid for and get them to the island get them to formosa and uh, i think that sends a strong message even more so than changing a policy on paper or, or rhetoric if that makes sense so thank, thank great you. great question thank you thank you ambassador tong kim go ahead please thank you ambassador uh, my question is a very broad and general one. I listened to you very carefully, your statement of uh, state of affairs everywhere, ranging from security, economy, political, and other issues as well. Thank you for doing this for us. Now, my question is very broad, as I said, what it is, are we better off in terms of security given the situation that you have described? And I might add to that, that given the North Korean determination not to give up nuclear weapons and their recent constitutional stipulation that they will keep increasing their nuclear weapons. And South Korean government is the last thing they want to do is to talk to North Koreans <laughs> under current circumstances. Now, current uh, Washington administration is not doing anything much at all, despite the extended deterrent and Pam David and other other actions they have taken that you have covered. As far as the diplomacy is concerned, we don't know when Biden administration would come up with a new idea of, to propose a new negotiate round of negotiation with North Koreans. As you know, today we don't have no agreement on arms race anywhere. ABC treaty is gone a long time ago and strategic talks gone a long time ago and now we don't even have a caps on the number of nuclear weapons that you can deploy at a time. And, and uh, nuclear posture does not uh, allow US to rule out the first the use of nuclear weapons, and so does the North Korea says, threatening they would not hesitate to use first nuclear use if they think it's necessary. My question is, are we better off today? Are we, do you feel more secure, security-wise, on the Korean Peninsula, for example, given the, all the situations and uh, Despite all the things, the positive signs and uh, some apparently have some deterrent effect, but nevertheless, it's not complete. I would uh, be interested in listening to your view. Yeah, so that's a terrific question. Thank you. Uh, you know, when when you become a national security advisor, and I served in a number of roles in government, and certainly had a background in, in studies and and. And in professional life, and, and the idea of a nuclear deterrent and how our nuclear triad works, 
but one of the first briefings you get is national security advisors, the continuity of government briefing and, and the nuclear briefing and how, how the football works and, and how the communications work and, and what would happen in the event of a nuclear attack. And it's an extraordinarily sobering briefing. And uh, when we do, and, and so, you know, the, the, let me start by saying, I think the number one thing we can do for the United States for our own security, but also for our partners, whether it's on the Korean Peninsula with the Republic of Korea, or, or our other partners in Europe who are under the American nuclear umbrella is to have a, an updated modern nuclear deterrent that focuses on the triad so that we've got our submarine launch ballistic missiles, our intercontinental missiles, and our, our air power, our, our bomber, our long range bombers. And we, we've made a big effort in the Trump administration. I'm pleased to see the Biden administration for the most part is continuing that effort to modernize the triad. So we're gonna get some modern missiles uh, in the silos. We're gonna get, uh, the B-21 Raider bomber that's being built by Northrop, and that's program is coming in on time and on budget. And, and we're going to start building a new Columbia class uh, ship, uh, submarine that can launch ballistic missiles. So we're modernizing the triad. We're not doing it fast enough. And frankly, I'm concerned that we, as the costs start to escalate, we're not going to do it in significant enough numbers to deter our adversaries. What we're watching happen in China right now is the Chinese have built a thousand missile silos outside of Beijing for the PLA rocket forces. Uh, that that is multiples of our, without getting into the details, multiples of our our the number of ICBMs that we have. We also have the Russians who've abandoned New Start, and I did the New Start negotiations with General Patrushev in Geneva back in October of 2020, and we came to an agreement on the extension of this New Start. Uh, the Biden administration went a different route and gave them a clean extension without a cap on tactical nuclear weapons, which we, we had put into our agreement. And now the Russians have even abandoned the, the clean extension of New START. So we, we, there's not much of an arms control framework left uh, between even the great powers. We tried to get the Chinese involved in the New START negotiations. They flatly refused and said they weren't going to have any, uh, put any constraints on the number of nuclear weapons that China would have. So great power nuclear arms control deals are uh, not basically non-existent at this point. And then we have proliferation on the Korean Peninsula. We, we achieved it in the Trump administration, a commitment, as you know, from Chairman Kim to denuclearize the peninsula. He didn't follow through, but he didn't also test any more nukes and he didn't test any ballistic missiles once we got our conversation started. Uh, the, the missile tests have started again. I hope the nuclear tests don't start. And then we've got the Ayatollahs and Mullahs in Iran who are, you know, hell-bent on, on a nuclear weapon. I, I think they're going to have one very soon. Uh, their breakout time is now in weeks, not months. And once that happens, you be assured that the the, the Saudis are going to get a nuke, uh, probably the UAE, uh, certainly the Turks. The Egyptians won't want to be out, left out of the game. And, and the Israelis will expand their, you know, their unreported capabilities. So... Uh, you know, we're at, we're at a stage right now in world history with non-proliferation of nuclear weapons where it's very dangerous, where the U.S. number one may be outmatched by its two principal adversaries, Russia and China, on the nuclear, on the strategic front. And we've got new players coming into the game. I mean, we've already had Pakistan and India has declared nuclear powers mm -hmm. uh, outside the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. And, uh, and we've got other countries that are like North Korea and, and Iran, which are clearly rogue regimes and state sponsors of terrorism, uh, also engaged in the nuclear game. And at some point, you know, even those who are under the nuclear umbrella, whether it's South Korea or Japan or uh, a Middle Eastern country, are going to decide that they need their own nuclear weapons since their adversaries have them. So we're in a very dangerous place, proliferation-wise. And we'll have to see how it plays out. But I, I think we need to, it needs to become more of a uh, a focus of American diplomacy, and, and the Biden administration needs to take note of it. Uh, unfortunately, I think with Iran, we've sent the wrong messages on these fronts, and uh, and it's not helping. But again, that's that's a debate that you know they, they take an opposite view, of course. But I think we're we're in a very dangerous situation nuclear-wise, something we haven't seen for many many years. Thank you, Ambassador Dan Erm. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you, David. Okay. Ah, great. So the question is, what criteria do you consider when determining whether to advise the president to apply national instruments of power? 
because it seems that many of the debates over whether the U.S. should intervene in Ukraine, Taiwan, and so forth come to questions of what's important enough to sacrifice U.S. resources. So I'm considering, I'm wondering if you have a set of internal criteria you consider when thinking about when and how to apply national instruments of power. No, that, that's a great question. And, and of course, all these situations are, are different. Uh, so there's there's not a a recipe, but I, I think the first thing we always consider is what's the threat to America's homeland, number one. Is there a threat to an American treaty ally, uh, number two. And, and then is there a threat to the international stability or to a partner or friendly nation? Is there a principle we need to uphold? So if you think about Ukraine, which is not a NATO ally and, and didn't have a formal alliance with the United States, but is a, a democracy, an emerging democracy, we've seen this, this play out before, at least in my lifetime, we've seen Argentina attack the Falklands and try and change the international borders by force. And they were re rebuked and, and driven back. We saw Iraq uh invade kuwait and try and make it the 19th province and again the world rallied and, and rebuked iraq and, and drove iraq out of kuwait and so we established this idea that the, the the principle of territorial expansion by conquest that you could get to use a, a legal term good title to to territory by by conquering or by military force that really hasn't been a a principle of international law since really the end of World War One, but certainly the end of World War II. Uh, Hitler tried to revive it, and uh, obviously the, the idea of the League of Nations and the, the Versailles Treaty tried to eliminate that idea the first time, but it came back again. But we, we you know, we, we, the, the West and the free world showed resolve, and through the most massive conflict in human history, we, we established that, those principles, and, we, and we've kept them in place, with whether it was the Falklands or, or Kuwait. Uh, and, and you know, hopefully that will take, be, the, be the case with, the, with Ukraine. So there, there, are, there are a number of different criteria that I think you'd look at. And then the question is, how do you respond to these crises? Because I think sometimes it's for, for Americans, it's easy to respond with military force or not, not easy, but that seems to be the first resort because we've had, at least for the last 30 years, a unipolar world where the United States forces had a, we didn't have a, a monopoly on force. We, we couldn't overwhelm any country, but we had a pretty good, uh, pretty good advantage over any adversary uh, militarily, and so uh, that, that that was sometimes a go-to response to a crisis. You know, uh, you know. But but I, I think one of the things I talked about in the White House, and I think President Trump agreed with, is that America has a lot of tools of national power. You know, we, it, whether it's soft power and, and uh, culture and propaganda, and I use that in a good way, not in a bad way. Uh, <laughs> Diplomatic power, economic power. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to achieve our ends, short of military power. And even when we start using military power, there's a continuum of yeah, of uh, resources that we have. And so, you know, I, I think you have to determine what the situation is, determine what principle we need to uphold, who we're protecting, or what 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 either what homeland we're protecting, ours or our allies or our partners, what principles we're trying to uphold. And then what's the best tool to respond to the, that? And sometimes it's a combination. And certainly whenever we can respond with our allies and with our partners, uh, and you know, ultimately, like in a situation like Kuwait, if you could get the entire you know, international community through a UN resolution or, or the first Korean War, which was we got with a UN resolution, although the Russians had walked out on that one, uh, and a lot of it happened, didn't exercise their veto, but you know, th that always is a force multiplier. So. Uh, good question, but I think you know you, you kind of run down that checklist uh, for both determining what to do and and how to respond. Thank you for thank that comprehensive answer. Great, David Lee, please. Hi, yes, uh, thank you so much for being here and for your remarks. Um, with the North Korean Parliament recently amending its constitution to solidify its nuclear status and policy, I was hoping to get your thoughts on not just whether the DPRK would willingly give up their nuclear program. Uh, which most, including members of this panel, would probably say no, but whether or not we've reached a point where the entire prospect of a denuclearized Korean peninsula is outright impossible or even paradoxical, and something that should be tabled entirely in any discussions or diplomacy efforts in the region, or whether we haven't reached that point or not. 
Yeah, so, so North Korea has bedeviled Republican and Democrat administrations, and it would be easy for me to say that, you know, we've got all the right answers on our side uh, and the Democrats don't, uh, because, look, you know, Kim Jong-un has moved forward and his father moved forward with the program, you know, through multiple administrations, starting with the H.W. Bush administration all the way through, Clinton, Obama, Bush II, uh, Trump. Uh, they're pretty committed to it, and this recent action of Parliament is, uh, you know, I, I discount that somewhat because Parliament wasn't going to do anything that the Supreme Leader didn't, you know, uh, tell him to do or the dear leader, you know, didn't tell him to do. So uh, it, if, if they did it, it could be undone as well. So I, I, I don't put too much stock in that. I, I see that more as a, a message to the West, and a message to South Korea, as opposed to an actual change in policy. But getting to your second question, how do you actually denuclearize the peninsula? That, that's a tough one. I mean, and, and it, you know, so far it's it's been out of reach. We came, I think, the closest in the Trump administration uh, to in, in, in administration in achieving that goal. But you know, when when Clinton passed on military force, you know, back in the '90s, that was probably the last best opportunity to to seriously seriously derail it. And I think we're now living with a, a nuclear North Korea. Now, you know, our response, the you know mobilizing our allies and partners and, and putting maximum pressure on Korea on, on the DPRK to you know ensure that they don't expand their stockpile and continue to test and develop even more dastardly weapons. I mean they're trying to develop a submarine launch ballistic missile according to press reports. Uh, the more we can do on the diplomatic side to discourage and, and make it more difficult for North Korea, the DPRK to, to achieve their ends, the better. But it's 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 really hard work and you know, it's it's it has it has not been easy, and uh, it's it's been a, a tough question for for every American administration for the last thirty years. So I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer for you, David. I'm sorry. Okay, he said, Jung, go ahead. He said, go ahead. Um, thank you, Ambassador, uh, for your time being here and sharing your insights. Um, my name is He Jae Jung. I'm from South Korea, and I'm currently studying international relations and honors humanities and economics at Azusa Pacific University in California. And my question great, great is about school. thank you. My question is about Taiwan and China conflict, and there is a small Taiwan island called Kinmen County near the southern China, and currently about hundred thousands of Taiwanese are residing in the island. And I believe China might attack the county first before invading the whole Taiwan to see how the U.S. reacts to this issue. So if China attacks Kinmen County, should the United States directly engage in war or what should the U.S. do? So, hey, hey, John, hey John, that's a good question. And it's a question that's been asked uh, since the presidential debate between uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard N. Nixon in 1960, and uh, talking about the islands of Kwame and Matsu. Uh, and we, we oftentimes forget in America that Taiwan is not just one island. It's not just the main island of Formosa, but it's it's a part of an island chain. And, and some of those islands are, are very close to uh, ch China, to the, to the mainland, to the PRC. Uh, some are as close as 12 miles, and they have ferry service to the, the mainland, and People do their shopping on the mainland, and, and there are very close ties on some of these outer islands uh, between the people of Taiwan and the people of the of, of China. And I've always, you know, look, I think that the Chinese are considering taking serious action against Taiwan. I think they may do it within the next year and a half before the end of this administration. Uh, my friend Admiral Phil Davidson, I think, probably agrees with me on that front. Uh, but what, what action they take is a question, whether it's a big Normandy-style invasion or Sicily-style invasion, amphibious assault, which you know people are concerned about and prepared for, or is it a blockade, or is it a slow salami slicing away of Taiwanese sovereignty by taking outer islands and, and starting to incorporate those into the mainland with Taiwan not being able to defend them adequately and uh, and winning initial battles just to see how the West reacts, how the free world reacts, how Japan reacts, Korea, America. So we, we, we don't know what the strategy that Xi Jinping will put into place if he does move, but I think it'll be a combination of a blockade and certainly some action against the outer islands that you posit. 
and we'll have to we'll have to see how that plays out. And you know, that in some ways that creates more of a, a trouble for American policymakers and and Japanese policymakers who are committed to the freedom of Taiwan, because you know. You, you worry about escalation. So if there's a, a blockade, a naval blockade, for example, of the island, you know, that's an act of war. A blockade is, is an actual act of war. But will, will America be prepared to break the blockade, to escort ships into Taiwan, to, to sink Chinese ships trying to enforce a blockade, to be the, to be the side that escalates the, the conflict? Which, you know, the, the conflict begins the minute there is a blockade, the minute an outer island is attacked. That, that conflict has begun. But you know, will the West and will Japan be willing to to escalate and to protect Taiwan? And, and so, I, I think it's most likely, and I think Phil Davidson and others agree that yeah, if there is an attack, it may not start out as a as the big Normandy style amphibious assault that we're all worried about, but uh, but it could it could start with an assault on the outer islands. And it could it could be a, there could be a blockade uh, or cyber attacks or gray zone activity like we saw more more in the first Crimea conflict in 2014 than we saw in this this later a attack on on ukraine so we'll have to see how that plays out but i think america has to remain strong and be prepared to to counter chinese action whether it's uh, whatever act of war is engaged in whether it's a blockade or taking the outer islands or or a full-scale uh, assault we need to have contingency plans in place to deal with each of those uh tactics thank you so, follow-up question, Joe Bosco. Ambassador, I wonder if you would focus for a minute on the role of China in North Korea's nuclear program. I mean, there's evidence that going back to the 1990s, China through Pakistan, the AQ Khan network, was funneling uh, technology, nuclear technology to North Korea. And ever, se ever since then, China has always protected North Korea diplomatically in the Security Council and elsewhere, and I'm I'm wondering if often postulated about this that China actually sees a North Korean nuclear program as an asset to China because it's a major distraction and diversion for the United States. We constantly have to kowtow. It's my term kowtow to China to get their co so-called cooperation on North Korea, but they never really deliver. North Korea proceeds inexorably with its nuclear and missile program, and China simply protects them diplomatically and economically as well, buying their coal, so forth. So do you think North Korea is part of China's strategic policy against the West and the United States? Yeah, so I, I tend to agree with your, your theory, Joe. You know, when we talk about China, oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, we're going to compete with them across the board, but there are areas that we can get along with the Chinese climate change as if you know, the Chinese who are building a coal plant a month care about climate change or they care about the environment when they polluted the Pacific Ocean with enough garbage to create an, you know, an island as big as a big island of Hawaii of garbage. And about 70% of that we've traced to Chinese shipping and Chinese dumping. So the idea that somehow we, we, we've got a common interest with China in, in green technology or climate change the only thing they want to do is sell us photo, you know, photo cells and solar equipment and batteries where they stole the technology from us, build it cheaper and sell it back to us. That's our interest in green energy. There, there, there's no real interest in, in China for climate change. Similarly, North Korea is one of those areas where people say, well, we're, we're on the same page with the Chinese, with North Korea. The Chinese don't want to see a nuclear North Korea. They're, they're, they're scared of Kim. He's a rogue in their area. He could use the nukes against them. Now, there probably are some strains between from time to time between the kim family and and beijing uh and when we think of north korea i, I always think of it as more of the kim family than a government uh you know it's like the sopranos got a hold of a country but uh you know the i i i don't think the chinese are aligned with us on north korea the only time they were aligned with us on north korea to be honest is when they thought we were going to you know exercise military force on north korea potentially destroy north korea's nuclear capability and its conventional capability and that there'd potentially be a re reunification of, of North Korea and South Korea because they're, they're scared to, the Chinese are scared to death of the Korean Peninsula becoming united because like you know, look at South Korea it's one of the economic miracles and, and national security miracles of the past two or three hundred years 
what they've done in the, in the past 40, 50 years. I mean, the and if you look at, as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty amazing what the North Koreans have done with no assets or very few assets, you know, other than the hard work of their people who are, you know, some, to some extent enslaved. But I mean, the, the Chinese look at North and South Korea coming together in one country and are terrified of it, of having a, a country with that kind of strength on its borders, especially if it's a, a democracy that believes in the rule of law and, and it's along the lines of the South Korean government. So I think that's the only time they get they're, they're helpful to us on North Korea is that they feel the North Koreans are going to lose and they're going to lose that buffer state. But other than that, I think I agree with you. I think they view North Korea as being a, a strategic asset to them, that it distracts us, distracts our allies and allows them to get away with things and engage in talks with us uh, purportedly in, that where we have a common interest, but we, we, you know, we really don't. So I, I don't think there's a lot of help coming from Beijing on North Korea. I think that's one of the fallacies. It's kind of like the whole idea that if we let them steal all our IP, that they, they'd like us more. I mean, and s somehow they become a democracy if we give them enough money and enough technology. And I just think it's, a, it's, 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 it's at best naive and, you know, at worst is, you know, you know, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it naive, cast aspersions on political opponents. Thank you, Richard White. Yes, can I ask Go about ahead. the same question about except about Russia's possible cooperation with North Korea's missile and program? There's been a lot of speculation on that. Yeah, Richard, that's a really good question. I, I look, I'm I'm very <laughs> concerned about it, especially. I think the Ukraine war has uh, probably lessened any inhibition there was on the Russian part to help the North Koreans, especially since the Russians are desperate, like like the Ukrainians are. I mean, this war is being fought now with, you know, 20th century and 19th century technology. It's an artillery war, and everyone needs 155 millimeter shells. And the, the North Koreans have a lot of artillery shells that the Russians could use, and they're desperate for them. And and uh, you know, you looked at that summit between Putin and and Kim, where they're you know standing looking over the missile silo. It looked like a Bond villain movie, you know, summit. And uh, I mean, the clear implication was the message the Russians wanted to send to the West, I guess, is that they've got nuclear, you know, we know the Russians have the most advanced missile technology in the world, and they, uh, some of ours and the Chinese, and they've got very advanced uh, nuclear technology. And so, uh, and and they know how to miniaturize and weaponize and, and put multiple reentry vehicles on rockets and, and missiles. And so, uh, you know, Putin was sending a definite si signal to the West that he could share that with the North Koreans. Whether he will or not, I, I don't know. My expectation is, sadly, is that the Russians are in, in a position now where they have to, where Kim will drive a hard bargain, and uh, the North Koreans will increase their level of proficiency in technology on the nuclear front by adding Russian expertise to Chinese and Pakistani expertise. So uh, I think it's a, a real concern. I think it probably happens. and. <clears throat> You know, Putin is is you know need, needs his uh, you know needs the armaments that South Korea, that North Korea has that the, the DPRK has in, in massive stockpiles. So I expect something bad to happen on that front, unfortunately. Very good, thank you, Masa Ota from Tokyo. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, this is the uh, Masa Ota from Tokyo. Good evening there and a good morning here. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, uh, regarding a uh, nuclear. As you say, the uh, China would increase the uh, number of nuclear weapons, and also there is no arms control prospect in the future. You know, as long as the uh, war is going on in grain. So you know, it's a uh, Robert Oppenheimer used to say that the uh, you know U.S. and the USSR it's a two scorpion in a bottle. Now we're gonna see the uh, situation of the uh, three scorpion in a bottle. So, yeah. Mr. Ambassador, how would you you know uh, you know find any uh, chance of the uh, future nuclear arms control among three nations? What would be a key driver to induce China to join this dialogue? That's my question number one. Also number two is a. Uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, declassification of the, uh, you know, five assurance toward the uh, Taiwan. What was the main reason to do so? Uh, maybe you indicate the uh, solidarity <coughs> with Taiwan is the number one point. 
but the uh, you know you should expect the uh, some repercussion from china so why did you declassify the uh, five assurance that's my question thank you very much ambassador yeah, thank you uh look i think the the issue on the nuclear issue the three scorpions in a bottle is a, a good way to put it so my response in that is that we, we need to be the biggest scorpion with the biggest stinger and if we're the biggest scorpion with the biggest stinger then hopefully the other two scorpions won't attack and and if they do we need to be able to deal with them but you know no one wants to ever deploy or or field a, a nuclear weapon and use it uh i certainly don't it could be you know he, there's, there's no winning that war and our adversaries need to understand that and and we need to be we need to have a modernized nuclear triad that discourages them and deters them from taking any action thinking that they could have a, a successful nuclear first strike on america and, and then there, thereby be able to take over the world or dominate the world and change the the balance of power and the only way to do that is it's not through talk it's not through do, the doctrine it's through having the the platforms and the weapon systems that, that we require to a to defeat their on the defensive side to defeat their attacks and then to have such a, a an overwhelming uh deter uh, overwhelming stockpile and and, and uh web delivery systems of our own that they never want to test us so that's the answer number one number two on the assurances we try to do as much as we could towards the end of the trump administration even even during the transition to send a strong message to beijing that uh america knew what they were up to and that we were going to stand by and, and let them change the world order that we were going to defend our liberty and defend the liberty of our partners and friends and so there were a number of steps that we took sanctions that we took out on chinese officials who ended freedom in hong kong and uh we we took out we we issued a, a genocide declaration secretary pompeo did on january 19th the day before he left office on the genocide in in Xinjiang with the uyghurs uh and and my decision to release the there were two big documents that we declassified one was our indo-pacific strategy which we we cleared that with our allies we made, we made sure japan and our our other colleagues who were mentioned australia and others that were in as part of that uh, strategy that they agreed with our declassification we want to send a message to the prc that the the partnerships and alliances in the pacific between the us and its partners or and allies are, are is a very strong framework and we thought that that would deter conflict and we felt the same way with the you know this doesn't quite go to joe's question about the you know indian strategic ambiguity but we would want to lessen the ambiguity and let them know that there were assurances that we'd give in taiwan and uh you know I mean, look i'm not naive enough to, to believe that the chinese hadn't seen them before i'm sure they had but by by you know let, letting them know that we were going to declassify our, our assurances and let the world know uh, i think that was to give support to our friends and and part democratic partners in taiwan and, and again, resource and ambiguity into this situation. So there were a number of steps we took on China, uh, and uh, that, that was one of them. Thank you, boss. Sing Jie Park from Seoul. Sing Jie? Uh, well, <clears throat> yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. My question is very simple. And if North Korea export sales to the Russia, so they can use their sales to artillery sales to the Ukraine. Uh, what uh, U.S. and Japan and Korea should to react? Thank you. Well, again, you know, this gets to the same question, uh, Mr. Yeah, Barger. It's, 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 it's a tough question. How do you deal with? How do you deter North Korea from engaging in malign conduct and uh, bad <clears throat> acts? Whether it's using artillery to shell South Korea or sending mini subs to South Korea or kidnapping Japanese citizens or building nuclear weapons. I mean, they're they're involved in so many malign activities. This would be the most recent. Now, they, they, you know, if they do do that and it's exposed and they, they export to Ukraine, they're going to lose, you know, any, any semblance of uh, credibility that they had in Europe and among the, the many countries that are supporting Ukraine. So I think it's a bad diplomatic move for North Korea. Uh, and then we'll have to get the gang back together and, and try and insist on maximum sanctions. And that, that probably involves some secondary sanctions against the Chinese who are engaged in business activities with the North Koreans. And we're going to have to, you know, no one wants to sanction China now in a big way. Certainly the, the Biden administration doesn't. 
the reality is they haven't really been sanctioned Russia in a big way since the invasion. The Russian Feder Federation Central Bank hasn't been sanctioned. Russia hasn't been kicked out of the Swiss system. Oil and gas sales are exempted from sa Russian sanctions. So I, I, I think we're going to have to get, if we want to bring this war to a conclusion, we're going to have to get much tougher on the sanctions front. And that's going to involve China. And no, no one wants to you know, have a fight with China now. But you know, for heaven's sakes, they float a spy balloon over our entire country. And we didn't do anything about it. It's, if North Korea sends artillery shells to Russia, they wouldn't do it without a Chinese wink and a nod at a minimum. And we need to make Russia and China pay for, for that activity. We may not be able to bring much influence on North Korea, but we can certainly make our displeasure heard with China, with the Beijing and Moscow. Very good. Thank you. Tong Kim, would you have a follow-up question? Tong. Thank you. All right. Okay, uh, I have one other question. As I said before, South Korean government of President Yoon Song Yeol is not interested in dialogue or trying to talk to North Koreans at all. And North Koreans excludes any possibility of even calling South Korea southern part of their country anymore. They call it different name, the ROK because they don't want to associate with South Korea at all. And uh, Yoon Song Yeol thinks from past experience, what we try to talk to North Koreans, there was a fake pe uh, peace, fake peace, which will evaporate as soon as the North Koreans stops talking to us. Now, Biden administration will have to convince the South Korean government first before it, if any, takes up any initiative, diplomatic initiative at all. My idea is if Washington proposes a unconditional talk with South Korea, uh, with the North Korea, DPRK, anything without uh, preconditions, of course, and uh, at any topic, anywhere, anytime, at any level, and you think that might uh, get North Korean interested in talking to us again with the, uh, the United States at least. Is it, you think that talking is still better than continuing confrontation and increasing tension of uh, nuclear dangers? Well, look, generally my, my philosophy is talking is useful. I mean, Churchill said that and Churchill was pretty tough that uh, it's better jaw jaw than mau mau. And uh, so, so generally I, I think talking is good, but what we can't do is we can't pay for talks. We can't make concessions to get the other side to come to the table. So paying for talks is a very bad idea because you go into those talks at a huge disadvantage and, and you portray weakness. So if you, if you can portray strength, going into talks uh, that that's useful but i don't think the north koreans at this point and i could be wrong there you know everyone on this call is more of an expert on korea than i am i had, I had great advisors with allison hooker and pottinger and and many others uh on the korean issues and so you all have a better feel for for what the north koreans will do than i than i do but my my gut feel tells me that the north koreans watching the situation right now don't think that there's any benefit to them from talking and if they are going to talk to the Biden administration, they're going to make them pay a price of admission. And uh, I mean, we saw this with the Iranians just recently to get five dual citizen wrongful detainees home. We had to unfreeze six billion dollars in sanctioned Iranian money that was being held in South Korea. And so the North Koreans look at that and see, think the South, the Iranians got six billion dollars for for you know five detainees. We ought to get something if we're going to if we're going to talk with the Americans. They're, they're they're paying for this sort of thing now. Let's see what we can get from the Biden administration. And I think you know the, 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 there there's a lobby that we're now learning about more and more in the in the press, in in the Democrat Party and in the Biden administration, a pro-Iranian activist. Uh, but I, I don't think there's a pro-DPRK lobby in the in the Biden administration. At least I hope not. So I, th I I'm not sure there'll be any pressure. On, on Washington to to pay for talks, so to speak, or to make concessions to get talks with the North Koreans. I, again, with this administration, you can't rule that out because 
they're so committed to talking that they're they're, they're willing to engage in, you know, I don't want to call it appeasement, but they they're willing to give a lot of concessions uh, to our adversaries. Uh, I don't want to use kowtow, but uh, we, we sent four cabinet secretaries in the last few months to Beijing to to beg the Chinese to engage in talks with us. So, so it's possible that they would be willing to do something like that for North Korea, but I, I don't think they will. And uh, I, I, I don't think at this point there's any benefit to the North Koreans of talks unless they get something out of it to start the talks. So my guess is we're going to be in, in the same kind of status quo we're in right now for some time. That's just, that's just my take. Well, thank you, Ambassador. This is a great evening. The time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Ambassador, we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great and... time. We'll get back to you. Great, Masa, great questions, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Good. God bless very you. Good. Tom, great. Richard, Joe, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ambassador. Sure. Stay tuned.